Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here. Welcome to our students and uh, friends and colleagues. And welcome to um, the students from Doha Institute. It is uh, my absolute honor to introduce uh, Professor Benjamin Lawrence. Uh, his bio is written in the fairest person, and I am tempted, I'm te tempted to read it as I. <laughs> I, I wish I, uh, th this was my bio. Okay, um, uh, Professor Lawrence uh, earned his PhD and his master's from Stanford University in history and his uh, BA and MA from UCL University College London. Uh, he's a legal historian whose work focuses on Africa with African migrants around the globe his research explores mobility, labor, and exploitation through time and space. He has written about historical and contemporary slavery, human trafficking, cuisine and globalization, human rights, refugee issues, and asylum policies. He is the editor-in-chief of the African Studies Review, the principal journal of the African Studies Association. He's the author of multiple uh, books and articles. I will just choose some of them. His first mono, uh, monograph, Locality, Mobility, and Nation from Rochester, examined the experiences of we men and women under French mandate rule in Togo. Uh, and it is, did it appear yet in French? No. Okay, but it's going to. It is poised to <laughs> appear in French. His second book, Amistad's uh, Orphans, from Yale University Press, examined with African child smuggling in the 19th century, reconstructing a familiar story, namely the 1840-41 Amistad Supreme Court case, uh, through the lens of children's experiences of enslavement. Among his other recent works, those examining forced uh, marriage, asylum, refugee issues. He also provided expert testimony in different trafficking and uh, asylum seeking uh, cases, where he chronicled some of these experiences in wide ranging essays, including African Economic History, uh, the Journal of African History, Biography, Slavery and Abolition, Anthropological Quarterly, uh, Canadian African Studies, and the African Studies Review, among others. He also co-chaired uh, the 59th annual meeting of the African Studies Association in Washington, D.C. Uh, last year, uh, the year before last year, 2016, uh, with the theme, Imaging Africa at the Center, Bridging Scholarship, Policy, and Representation in African Studies. For those of us who attend ASA, we know what a big deal that is. So, Congratulations, Professor Lawrence. Uh, Professor Lawrence also is a consultant on contemporary uh, political, social, and cultural issues in various countries in Western Africa. And as of 2017, he served as an expert witness for over 380 petitions by West African migrants in the US, Canada, and the UK, the Netherlands, Israel, and many other countries. And his opinions had been features, uh, featured in the U.S. Department of State, uh, the Japanese UNH, uh, agency? Yeah. UNHCR, the World Bank, the Austrian Red Cross Immigration and Refugee Board uh, of Canada, and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this, as we know, uh, has been central in some of the work that uh, Professor Benjamin is doing in these different fora, I think it's just very important for asylum seekers to have an advocate uh, uh, and best uh, expert uh, testimonies on their behalf. Um, he, uh, he is currently professor of anthropology at University of Arizona in Tucson, and his work had been uh, sponsored, uh, funded by the American Council for Learning, of Learning Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and fellowships at Stanford, Yale, Harvard University, and he's currently on a, post, on a doctoral fellowship 
at our sister Jesuit University of Notre Dame at the Kroc Institute of Peace. Uh, please, uh, you can visit University of Arizona website, History Department, to learn more about African Studies Review and the link to that upcoming events, upcoming talks, and tours by Professor uh, ben uh, Lawrence Benjamin, Benjamin Lawrence. Uh, please join me in welcoming him and also in supporting him as he came today and was in a car accident on his way to SFSQ. So he is such a good sport to stick around and uh, with such poise and grace. Wonderful. Hi, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I'm going to sit down on a stool, not because I'm gravely injured. I'm only minor. I only have a bit of whiplash. <laughs> the car, on the other hand, didn't fare so, bad, so well. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. It's the first time I've ever, been, I've ever given a talk where there was a safety demonstration beforehand. I was waiting for the oxygen masks to fall out of the ceiling. But that didn't happen. Um, I appreciate that you introduced me by talking about asylum because that's what I want to talk about today. So um, what I'm going to talk about is based on a current research project, a current book project. Um, this is kind of an article version of one chapter uh, that is underway. And it's based on research that I have done. And when I say that, I I mean that a little bit differently to the way some of us do research and the way that I've done research in the past. Uh, it's, it's research with the people who, via their attorneys or their lawyers or their solicitors, contact me to be an expert for their asylum cases. So these are, this is a very self-selecting group of, of individuals who have very complex conditions that have given rise to their refugee seeking in different countries. And, um, and so uh, without any further introduction, I think I'll, I'll move into the talk. And uh, yeah, I like to sit on a stool so that I don't wander around and lose the mic and get distracted. It keeps me a little bit more focused. Um, I also get to see people more carefully and pay attention to my slides. So, um, but uh, if you have questions, if I could ask you just to hold on to them till the end, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, so let's begin with uh, the story, uh, the story of the slave next door. So in uh, October 2016, very recently, uh, a woman known only as A.E. escaped from domestic slavery in suburban Houston. And her enslavers, Chudi and Sandra Tsobundu, a Nigerian-American couple with five children who owned a health care business, had brought her into the United States under false pretenses two years earlier. According to court documents, AE was made to work seven days a week from 5.30 a.m. to 1 a.m. the next day. She could not take breaks, sit down, or watch TV. She could not use the telephone, see a doctor for her poorly healing arm. She couldn't attend church regularly or walk, down, walk beyond the immediate neighborhood uh, with, her, with, with the children that she was uh, custodian of. She was forced to sleep on the floor in the children's bedroom in the space between their beds. If she wanted milk for her tea, it had to be drained from the children's cereal bowls. The defendants also subjected her to physical and emotional abuse. They called her idiot and slapped her and hit her on the necks and arm on a weekly basis until the situation came to the attention of federal investigators with the help of a concerned uh, neighbor. In The Slave Next Door, Kevin Bales and Ron Sudalta exposed the disturbing phenomenon of human trafficking and slavery in the United States. They identify, hidden in plain sight, slaves such as dishwashers in neighborhood restaurants, street hawkers selling trinkets, and janitors cleaning department stores locked in at night, and they celebrate their rescue, their liberation, and their reintegration into U.S. society. 
I think there are three points worth noting from their analysis with respect to today's brief presentation. First, according to the data collected by Bales and others, the second highest number of trafficking victims in the US are enslaved domestic workers. Second, the fre frequently that women become slaves through legal channels, such as arriving on legitimate work visas, only to find bondage under the slaveholder's roof. And third, Bales and Sudalta contend that there are no large-scale domestic slavery rings. It is not the type of offense that lends itself to crime syndicates. Instead, they contend trafficking pe trafficked people are sold one or two a time through mom and pop operations requiring only an outside consumer who is complicit. Now, I have some bones to pick with this last argument, this last contention, but perhaps we can return to that in Q&A. So among the key tensions in their analysis identified was the fact that most US American audiences didn't recognize the existence of slavery, and they assumed that it had ended with the Civil War. And even when presented with evidence, they disputed the notion that particular individuals were indeed slaves. Isolated stories, however, shock audiences in the global north into reckoning with the legacy of an ongoing prevalence of coercion in domestic service and in its worst form, urban slavery. In 2000, the 2016 story of the Nutso Bundus, both now serving time for, for jail, jail time for slavery is illustrative. For two years, the couple held AE captive, ostensibly as a maid or a nanny in their home. US immigration laws and regulations require that citizens of certain foreign countries who seek admission to the US obtain a visa prior to entry. So the couple knowingly provided a false visa application to the victim to be submitted with numerous other pieces of false information. After obtaining the woman's visa, the couple paid to transport the nanny, quote unquote, to the US. <clears throat> Once here, Sandra Zobundo took the victim's passport and copies of her bank statement, and the couple hid the woman's passport and visa with the intent to violate the forced labor statute. They admitted this was, an, in fact, an effort to maintain her labor services through her enslavement by the couple sorry, throughout um, her enslavement by the couple, AE was not permitted to have her passport or her visa, and they made her believe that failure to perform the labor and services would result in serious harm to her. The couple admitted that they indeed threatened harm to AE if she did not cook, clean, and tend to their children. AE told the investigators that she was forced to sleep on the floor, bathe in cold water, eat leftovers, and work nearly 20-hour shifts seven days a week from September 2013 until October 2015. Chudi Tsubundu pled guilty to visa fraud. He, falsely, he stated that he falsely um, claimed the woman was married and that was, she was his sister and that she was 20 years older than she really was and that she'd be traveling to the U.S. for her niece's graduation. The Tsobundus covered her expenses to Houston, but as soon as she stepped into their vehicle on September 29th, 2013, Sandra Tsobundu seized control of the woman's passport and other personal belongings. A ultimately broke free. She self-liberated in October 2015, sometime after she learned that she hadn't been paid since arriving in the U.S. The Tsobundus had assured her that they had deposit money in a Nigerian bank account. Two weeks before her escape, she called, that is, AE herself, called the National Human Trafficking Resource Center to report a potential domestic servitude situation in Caddy, Texas, according to the court papers. A case manager with the YMCA International Trafficked Persons Assistance Program then helped AE flee from the Tsobundus home. A escaped her predicament because a tip of her own, her own tip, to the National Tra Human Trafficking Resource Center in October 2015 thus sent the government's case into motion. And after she was rescued and her identity protected, she came a, became a witness for the prosecution. From the court ordered settlement, she will receive about $120,000 uh, in wages owed. In fact, that was just adjudicated last week. Of course, the Tabundus are bankrupt, so she'll probably never see a penny. 
What has now got to be emphasized, according to assistant, then assistant US, US attorney Robert per Ruben Perez, what has got to be emphasized is we're here not only to punish people, but to rescue the victims. Ruben Perez heads the human trafficking unit for the Southern District of Texas. Now, it's unclear if by cooperating with the, a with the prosecution, AE will be able to access a victim of trafficking visa, which guarantees protection or permanent withholding of removal to Nigeria. But this story illustrates the two paths of resistance that are today imagined by most humanitarians and anti-trafficking campaigners for contemporary slaves in this neoliberal age. That is statutory protection, laws against slavery, and immigration protection, a pathway through a regularization process of a visa. And it shows how these two are in fact deeply interwoven. So contemporary West African urban enslavement stories parallel many of the insights of Bales and Sedalta. But lesser legal and socio-structural support for rescue and recovery gives rise to innovative strategies. Anderson and O'Connell Davidson have observed that West African trafficking is not simply a new form of slavery, but rather a complex, multivalent, and multi-sided process. And Fernandez O'Connell Davidson, Fernandez and O'Connell Davidson have discerned exit strategies to be tightly, tightly controlled. So in previous work, I have demonstrated how some urban slaves subject themselves to smuggling networks, and they subordinate themselves to traffickers and seek to seek asylum beyond the subregion. The majority of trafficking victims employ a combination of personal, legal, and economic and social strategies to terminate or to renegotiate the relationships of coercion. Today, I'd like to briefly narrate the experience of three other Nigerian trafficking survivors and use their experiences to compare how these two strategies of contemporary urban slave resistance, namely immigration protection in the form of asylum seeking abroad and domestic legal recourse at home through the laws, the statutes that exist, to better understand the lived experience of urban slaves in Nigeria. So asylum testimonies and published accounts of domestic trafficking prosecutions from several West African countries provide rich details of physical, emotional, and sexual exploitation, shedding light on the underbelly of the globalized economy in sprawling African urban conglomerations like Lagos, Abuja, and Kano, but with, relative, uh, with relevance for far beyond even here in the uh, Middle East and in the Gulf region. Via these stories, I hope to show that partly because of increasing globalized transnational economies, the modalities of slavery have changed dramatically in West Africa. But the actual tools and resources trafficking individuals have to draw upon to liberate themselves have changed little in the past hundred or more years since the first court-ordered liberations in colonial Africa. The persistence of unfreedom in the contemporary epoch is a cause of much consternation on the part of government agencies, anti-slavery activists, and neoliberal economic theorists. How to characterize contemporary forms of exploitation against historical patterns of slavery and slave trading is among the more vexing issues. While the Palermo Protocol provides a current definition of trafficking, it seems far too uncritical to view trafficking simply as a new, as a form of, a new form of slavery. It is a complex, unstable, multivalent, and multi-sided process. Slavery, trafficking, and coerced labor are all subsets of unfree labor. And these types of unfreedom reside on a dynamic continuum of exploitation. Just as a state's capacity to authorize or deny entrance to, national, to a national territory has been shown to produce illegal immigration, so too the conflation of with migration and refugee protection produces new forms of unfreedom by classifying trafficking subjecthood with such terms as historic, live, or ongoing. And I can point you to some citations about those issues, if you like. 
As I recount in these three experiences, I'd like you to pay attention to both the circumstances of the urban enslavement and the path to liberty, both real and imagined. Each of these cases concerns a real woman who has since won protection and earned the right to live in the UK. These are also cases for which I personally served as an expert witness and provided a written report, which was a determining factor in their respective claims for protection. And they have subsequently granted me permission to speak with them and then discuss their experiences with others. I interpret the asylum seeking by these three Nigerian trafficking survivors as an infra-political infra -political strategy whereby applicants instantiate an incomplete, liberated subjecthood in order to move further along the unfreedom continuum. So it's obvious to me, but perhaps may not be to you, that asylum seekers we are talking about today have already escaped their traffickers, right? They've left the houses when they then fail, file for protection. They are no longer held in bondage when they're asking for protection against being trafficked. They live, they work, they shop, they are already rebuilding their lives Th through psychosocial counseling and with the help of psychotropic medication. But they view themselves as remaining unfree until they successfully resist attempts to remove them back into the context from whence arose their subjugation, either by their traffickers or by the British government and the immigration authorities. So trafficking victims move nimbly between what James Scott calls overt collective defiance and complete hegemonic compliance to dismantle their unfree and trafficked status. The challenges these women's stories offer to their trafficking context are authoritative and provocative, but they must also be viewed in the context of deeply uneven power relations, often accompanied by threats of deportation incarceration, and violence. They engage a veiled discourse of dignity and self-assertion in a public setting, a court, which, unfortunately to us, disguise, mutes, and cloaks ideological arguments. And the stories you'll hear today are just several of many strategies that have evolved in the highly mobile transnational world of asylum-seeking and global human trafficking. So Tio was born in Lagos in Nigeria in 1979 and is Yoruba. As a child, she was raised by her maternal grandparents in Benin City. Her grandfather was a very well-known traditional healer. Her grandparents were members of secret societies. When she was 16, she injured her leg. She was taken to a shrine and held there while her leg healed. The traditional healer was contracted into a marriage with her against her will by her grandparents. The healer raped her multiple times and once her he leg had healed, she escaped and took a bus to Lagos. From Lagos, her mother and uncle helped her to Abidjan. In Abidjan, she stayed with a woman who owned a canteen. She slept on the floor with other girls. And there she met a man called John, who offered to take her to Spain for work. John arranged a passport, and they traveled from the Ivory Coast to Morocco. In Rabat, they attempted to enter Spain via an underground tunnel. The first two times, that is the part of Spain that's in North Africa, right? There's no tunnel across the Mediterranean. Uh, the first two times they were intercepted. The third time they succeeded in entering Ceuta, Spain, and in this refugee camp they were processed and then given documents. They were then relocated to Madrid, and in Madrid they met a woman. Tia was, able, was made to shave and cut shave off all her hair and cut her nails, and the rem remnants were then collected by this woman to create a juju to control her. After this, they went to a hotel, and she was forced into prostitution. And she was informed that she had to work to repay a debt of 60,000 US dollars that the woman claimed she had thus incurred. She tried multiple times to regularize her status in Spain. She met a Nigerian, and they married and she was then trafficked to France to work as a prostitute again. She tried to leave, but she was told she still owed $20,000. The woman threatened her with juju, and Tio believes it worked because she had multiple miscarriages. So around 2006, after surgery in the, from the hospital, she absconded again and changed her phone number, and based on her marriage to a Spanish resident, she was allowed to remain in Spain. 
She then applied for a visa to the UK for her daughter, who was born in 2011. She relocated to the UK and she sought asylum and refugee protection because she feared reprisal actions, including the juju, from her traffickers and from the woman who forced her into prostitution. So A.O., this is the second story, A.O. was born in Jeba and is of Yoruba and Hausa ethnicity and of a Christian Muslim household. She completed secondary school and nursing study and she became pregnant at the age of 20 and married. At some point, she was contacted by a woman called Mama G, a recruitment agent. Her husband was supportive of her desire to work as a nurse and allowed her to discuss the issue with Mama G because he was concerned for their safety in northern Nigeria. Her husband met Mama G in Lagos and then they paid for a contract. So AO met with Mama G to enact an oath or a covenant prior to her travels. So in the interview, she recounted a physical oath including language and a ritual performance and the consumption of solids and liquids. Ao expressed the view that there, was a, that there was, in the package that she consumed, human body parts. Incisions were made on her body in black powder and was mixed with blood and rubbed onto her skin. But Ao was reluctant to divulge too many details because she explained it, it is a secret that must stay in my mouth. Once the covenant was completed with Mama G, Ao was surprised to learn that she was traveling by boat to the UK. When she confronted Mama G, she was beaten. Mama G controlled her and had all her documents. She traveled with 10 girls and women, and they were all made to change their names. One girl died on the voyage and was, had body thrown over the, board, over the ship. Uh, which a ship that began in Lagos went via Abidjan on land, then by sea to the Tilbury docks in London, and then by cab to the building where she found herself. So in London, Ao explains that she and the others were met by receivers. Mama G knew lots of people on the docks. She was in the brothel run by Mama G, and then she was punished for resisting the prostitution to which she was subjected. She was kept in one of several numbered rooms and forced to work as a prostitute. She was kept prisoner and forced to work for five years, sleeping with eight to ten men a day on average. The day she escaped was different to other days because she felt cold air, and then she saw the door was open and there was no one at the door for the first time. Uh, and then she saw a security guard standing outside, but he just let her walk straight on by. So Ao explained that her family living in Joss had been killed in, 20, in 2008, 2009, and she only learned of this after arriving in the UK. She feared reprisal actions from her traffickers and the woman who forced her into prostitution, and she also feared being punished for prostitution by other Nigerians, and so she sought refugee status in the UK. So the final story is RD. RD was born in Owiri in the Delta part of Nigeria, in 1964. And she's married and she has a number of children and a formal education to the level of high school. She worked in a market for some time before she was asked by the E family to work as an office assistant for their publishing company, which had offices in Lagos and Abuja. She worked as an office assistant delivering and buying things, but she also worked as an office domestic worker, cleaning and so forth, although it was not part of her job description. And then she was brought to the UK by Mr. E in 2008 as a visitor for five months in the capacity as a housekeeper or domestic servant. Mr. E and his people organized the traffic traveling documents for RD without her knowledge or assistance. And at some point, RD was uh, the head of all the office assistants and she was asked by E's wife to come to London and to work there. So a domestic visa was obtained on her behalf, and she was to be paid 250 pounds a month. In the UK, however, she was only paid 50 pounds a month, and the rest was held back until later. She worked from 4.30 a.m. every day and would stay often awake until midnight. She never legally received her back wages owed to her, although this is an ongoing matter of dispute. And soon after moving into the house in Reading, E raped her. She immediately told her husband back in Nigeria what had happened and other friends and planned to leave, but the E family had her passport. 
In August 2010, she considered going to the police station. She initially began walking, but hesitated and turned back. She managed to contact a niece for advice, and after yet another incident, she contacted her niece, who cautioned her to flee to the police, where she sought protection. The police then arrested Mrs. E and regained R.D.'s passport. So these three women's paths to immigration regularization in the UK are illustrative of a particular and perverse contradiction in the current state of global anti-trafficking practice, namely what appears to be the potential for an interminable form of enslavement from contemporary asylum policy and migration securitization. In liberating themselves from servitude and applying for asylum protection in the UK, and against future enslavement, each individual risked being returned to the very conditions that gave rise to their multiple and different forms of bondage. So to attain refugee protection and to gain security from being returned to their original enslavement context, they had to perform the status of a present day live and ongoing trafficking victim in order to convince the US, uh, sorry, the UK immigration enforcement agents that their agency, their own capacity to liberate themselves was in fact incomplete and indeed unattainable if it was uncoupled from the public transcript of a decision emanating from a court. So just to be clear, what I'm saying here is that in order to demonstrate and to secure their freedom, they had to show that detached from a court judgment affirming their status as a slave, they could never be free. So essentially, to be liberated, they had to confess publicly to the failure of their own act of self-liberation that was, at that very time, underway as they presented themselves before an immigration court. Is the paradox the conundrum becoming clear. So this seemingly paradoxical situation is only part of an even more complex picture. So to prevail before an immigration judge, a trafficking victim's performance of classic courtroom conventions, such as good speech, narrative, rationality, embodied affect, that's really sufficient. Instead, a documentary corpus colloquially known as a bundle in the United Kingdom, consisting of various reports, such as the report that I submitted, must accompany the asylum applicant on their way, on their path towards a determination. So all three women were represented by a barrister, right, a senior lawyer, who argued that the accompanying bundle of documentation proved the experience of enslavement was real and live, ongoing. What we know of these three cases is that their barristers were successful, right? The respective judges agreed and concluded that each woman's context of vulnerability and the conditions of exploitation had indeed been, uh, had been used to affect the respective acts of trafficking of the individual, right? So they took, the, they accepted the argument. So the judges, each individually, sustained the argument of the barrister supported by my expert testimony, that there was a sufficiency of protection by the Nigerian authorities, sorry, an insufficiency of protection by the Nigerian authorities, and that the risk of real, of re-trafficking, of being re-trafficked along the paths that they had previously come, was real and serious. So each woman needed voluminous and detailed documents, what elsewhere I call unfreedom papers, for without them, their claim would likely have come to naught. So what I call unfreedom papers, these bundles of documentation that consist of diverse records detailing the persistence of coercion and the failures of neo-abolitionist legislation, that is new anti-trafficking laws that exist in Nigeria, in the UK, here in Qatar, and in most countries in the world, what I've called unfreedom papers have become indispensable to asylum claims submitted by survivors of a complex dimension of contemporary slavery routinely described as human trafficking. Nowadays, in the absence of corroborating testimony, right, the person who was trafficked with them, 
trafficking survivors struggle to prove their status and to gain access to refugee protection, not to attain their freedom. Walking out the door, well, it took a few years, but she was able to do it. RD could walk out that door. She was free, but she wasn't protected against re-enslavement without a court context. So survivors of trafficking networks seeking to exit the seemingly interminable conditions of trafficking subjectivity must produce these bundles or these unfreedom papers detailing the extent of slavery and trafficking and the likely failure of the neo-abolitionist legislative anti-trafficking paradigm to protect them were they returned to Nigeria or to another country. <clears throat> As I have told you that all three of these women gained protection and are now rebuilding their lives, I want to now turn to a brief discussion of how to read and theorize these stories and how to analyze the textuality of the asylum story of which they're part and the, the asylum process of which they are embedded. So this is necessarily thin and a brief discussion in the interest of time, and it's part of a larger book project that I've been working on. I don't know when that's going to finish. We'll see. But Rose Byrne has explained that refugee law draws on criminal law and civil law, and it's not simply human rights practice or international humanitarian law, and thus, preponderant, thus problems like the one I've described are preponderant. People talk about refugee law, but there isn't really a thing that is recognized as refugee law. The measurement of consistency and plausibility of a refugee narrative can never be an exact science. And how much of one or the other depends on many factors, according to James Sweeney. And according to John Zelesnikov, refugee status determination operates within a discretionary legal domain, what James Hathaway calls the fundamentally subjective caprice, which unfolds in policy and procedure attendant to highly malleable conceptual standards and practices, many of themselves of which are subject to legal challenges, judicial review, and international mandates, and public criticism. All right, so refugee decision-making is policy. It's very rarely part of a legal process. Michael Kagan discerns the central elements of credibility in a narrative of a refugee as between positive and negative factors, and they are accorded probative weight in a decision-making process. So the positive factors for a refugee are detail, specificity, consistency, furnishing all the details early on in the proceedings, and general plausibility. The negative factors are vagueness, contradiction, delayed relevation, revelation of all the details and facts, and general implausibility. These powerful probative criteria, however, may not be divorced from the multiplicity of production contexts. And as Rose Byrne observes, asylum seekers have to deliver their, credi their testimony credibly, and they must be found credible in multiple contexts over and over again. And so I put to you, the people whose stories sound the same over and over again, the people who rehearse their stories, people who rehearse are actors. Stories that are incredibly consistent time and time again are much more likely to be the ones that are false. And psychologists demonstrate that traumatized individuals, such as women who are raped or subjected to trafficking, are much more likely to have inconsistent stories when they tell it to one person or to another person. They might tell a woman that they've been raped, and they might tell a male investigator that they haven't. But that inconsistency is used by refugee, determine, determine, refugee deciders as a measure of inconsistency and thus a factor in their incredibility. So credibility assessments speak to a general tension embodied in asylum seekers, insofar as they are thrust between the imagined and the idealized legal protections and national realities and the arbitrariness of domestic immigration control. Jenny Milbank has argued that credibility draws attention to the intensely narrative mode of refugee status determination's adjudicatory power and the central importance of communication. 
On the one hand, the decision maker recognizes that genuine claimants fulfill the humanitarian objectives of the fundamental human rights goals of the Refugee Convention, right? So people who are making refugee de decisions, they want to grant protection to ones that sound real and legitimate. But on the other hand, the same decision makers, they are recognized that, they recognize that non-genuine applicants are part of ordinary immigration control. Their duty is to find those people, zero in on them, and cull them from the pack. So while those unfamiliar with expert testimony may cast a suspicious eye at the, the use of, for example, newspaper articles, such as a Time magazine article or the CNN website, cited as evidence, my analysis here is informed by extensive interactions with the UK Home Office and my experience reviewing more than 100 reasons for refusal letters. Those are the negative letters that the decision makers send as to why you have not been granted protection. Adjudicators are not required to, to accord weight to different uh, types of evidence based on their value. They don't have to seek country condition information that supports a counterposition. The UK Home Office provides little gu guidance about using country of origin research information, such as, for example, NAPTIP, the, National, the Nigerian uh, Anti-Trafficking uh, Agency's annual reports, or the court cases that it's worked on. And they generally only require that a narrative be evaluated against uh, evidence that they call in the round. That's the UK legal formulation. We have considered all the evidence in the round, and we have found your case to be uncompelling and lacking in credibility. So I think I must have lost a slide somehow. So the, the 2015 iteration of the UK asylum policy instruction reads, and I'm quoting, the question to be asked is whether taken in the round the caseworker accepts what he or she has been told and the other evidence provided. In practice, if the claimant provides evidence that, when it is considered in the round, indicates that the fact is reasonably likely, it can be accepted. A caseworker does not need to be certain, convinced, or even satisfied of the truth of the account. That sets too high a standard of proof. It is enough that it can be accepted. <clears throat> Waiting evidence for relevance and bias, let alone scientific and scholarly merit, is beyond the remit of the UK Home Office. So as you can hear from that definition, in the round is defined as being in the round. What a great definition. It's kind of like um, high school level writing. But I didn't say that in my report. So I'd now like to turn <clears throat> briefly to the women's stories and to talk about how the UK Home Office looked at these issues. So for TO, so the National Referral Mechanism, which is a, a body in the UK and in other countries that looks at trafficking cases particularly, they concluded that TO was indeed a victim of human trafficking. The UK Home Office accepted that she was a member of a particular social group. That's a requirement for refugee protection. Namely, a woman victim of human trafficking from Nigeria in Spain, and they accepted that she was trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation. But they rejected the cult, cultic aspect that she described in her story, and thus they dismissed the entire claim. In the case of AO, the UK investigators, the first investigators, they made a positive dis decision about her narrative. The National Trafficking Referral Mechanism, however, concluded that AO was not a victim of human trafficking largely because it believed she was not who they said she was, but rather another person entirely, and had applied for multiple visas with different names. This is a classic home office process. Well, everything you say is true, but you're not who you say you are. So we're rejecting your story. And in the third case, a responder, sorry, in the third case of RD, 
the first responder found that RD's narrative was consistent with other victims. And the National Crime Eng Agency's national referral mechanism, again, concluded that there were reasonable grounds that RD was a victim of human trafficking. Notice, was. But the conclusive grounds, aff while affirming this decision, then the UK Home Office decided to not give her the benefit of the doubt because she had waited several years to report the rape as a component of her trafficking incident and that she had walked out the door and there, and there was thus, thus no longer a victim. She was no longer a slave. She was no longer a trafficked person. She was a historically trafficked person. So in all three cases, the UK did not accept that it was genuine fear about being returned to Nigeria. They sought to return them to Nigeria because it held that there was sufficient protection from organizations like this, NAPTIP, uh, in Nigeria, including the Nigerian police force. And in my report, which I wrote, that the Nigerian police are indeed quite corrupt and can be bribed, and I detailed examples, and I detailed how uh, women can't very easily go to the police if they've been raped because they're likely to be returned to their families and all sorts of other sort of hypothetical scenarios of what might happen if a trafficking victim is returned. The UK Home Office insisted that, tra that the Nigerian authorities were willing and able to offer a sufficiency of protection. They turned to the, UK, the United States uh, states trafficking in persons reports to find examples of trafficked people who had been rescued. So in my report, I talked about the volume. Yes, 200 people were, were rescued in 2015, but 10,000 people were trafficked. So you tell me what the likelihood is that one person sent back is going to get protection, 0.012%. So I sort of explained it in this sort of numerical, quantitative way. Fortunately, for each of them, each of the three women we're talking about, an immigration judge was convinced by my report and by other materials submitted by the barristers, and they set aside the decision of the Home Office. <clears throat> so trafficking survivors, that's the statute, statutes that are often used as examples of why there is a law. There's a law in the country, you need to first go to the police, use the law, and then when you've done that, if then you're trafficked again, then you come back to us and tell us, after you've escaped a second time, that the law isn't working. So trafficking survivors who relocate voluntarily or forcibly to Europe or North America and submit asylum, refugee or humanitarian protection claims are subject to intense scrutiny. As refugee narratives may provide access to legal and political membership in a host country, juridi juridical and immigration authorities view misrepresentation or lying very seriously. April Shimak observes that the scrutinizing of testimonies makes narratives the sites of surveillance and the policing of national boundaries. And Jacques Derrida highlighted how confirmation of the veracity of the claimant's story can never be achieved through expert testimony, which is, in fact, testimony about testimony, when he observed that there is no testimony <clears throat> which does not structurally imply in itself the possibility of fiction, simulacra, dissimulation, lie, and perjury. But today we're not here to judge whether these women's stories are true, real, or fraudulent. Globally, only a tiny percentage of trafficking survivors gain access to useful documentation, to expertise, and to interpretive assistance, right? An interpreter in the court helping them tell their story and making their case before a judge. And a tiny fraction of trafficking victims attain justice for the horrific crimes committed against their person. Only 16% of migrants held in US civil detention facilities, the United States doesn't imprison migrants, right? They're in detention facilities. They're not in prisons. They're wearing orange jumpsuits. 
that are in the same cell as prisoners, <laughs> but they're not prisoners, they're detainees. And they have legal rights. I'm sorry, I must have skipped the, sorry. The slides were reordered somehow. That's from earlier on, right? So in the United States, only 16% of migrants are held in US civil detention facilities. And uh, sorry, only 16% of those in held in facilities have access to legal representation, to someone to represent them. An essential first step to then securing an expert and securing an interpreter, right? So the stages alone just to get to someone who can help translate their story. In the UK, which proportionately detains more asylum seekers than all European Union countries combined, and for longer periods, some of the cases I've worked on, they've been in detention for two, three, four years. And they go, they go crazy, right? Often I start a case and three years later I'm reading two psychi psychological and psychiatric evaluations of the same person because after three years in d solitary confinement, they've gone crazy. In the UK, migrants have even fewer rights and protections than citizen offenders. So a person who's charged with a criminal act in the UK has more rights than a person who's an asylum seeker, fleeing brutality, torture, rape, forced marriage, or trafficking. So without an asylum petition, without a successful asylum petition, granting refugee status or other humanitarian protection, trafficking survivors may reside in an interminable, interminable unfreedom. In the words of Julia O'Connell Davidson, denied the core elements of the bundle of rights and freedoms <clears throat> that make flesh and blood human beings into persons in contemporary society. So if I've inspired any of you to consider a career in immigration representation or asylum and humanitarian justice, then today's talk will have been a success. And I want to conclude <clears throat> by drawing your attention to something that I came across just today, these documents. Now, how many of you have been to the slavery museum in, here in Qatar? Half of you, maybe? I think it's the best slavery museum I've ever seen. It's not called that. So, I know it's not called that. It's called the Musharib yeah. Museum, and it's the um, Bin Jalmud House. And not the slavery museum, but let's just call it that for shorthand. It's a remarkable museum. And here are two documents from Qatari slaves who, if you want to come up and read them, you can see they fled on a boat, on a dhow, to Bahrain, and they went to the British consul and they petitioned for protection for, for, against their enslavers and were granted emancipation certificates by the British uh, consul in Bahrain in the 1940s. So this is not a story just about Nigeria. This is not a story about the UK or the US with which I began. This is a global story. It's happening everywhere. It's happening here today. It's happening as we know from the story that's been in the news of the murdered Filipina maid uh, in one of your neighboring uh, uh, kingdoms. It's a story that happens daily and uh, the more we can learn about it, the more we can uh, find ways to combat it. Thank you.